The data from cosmology suggests the designer of the universe. Let's look at some of that. Dyson, Clavin, and Suskin are uh, cosmologists, not cosmetologists, but cosmologists um, at Princeton, Stanford, and MIT, and they published an article in 2002 titled Disturbing Implications of a Cosmological Constant. And in that article, they look at the physics as we understand it today. And they said, well, the way the universe is, it's extremely hostile. And in fact, life in our universe, given physics, is extraordinarily unlikely. In fact, in, they, they contend that in order for life to have even appeared in our universe at any point, there would have had to have been an unknown agent who intervened for reasons of its own and create conditions that were incomprehensible. Now, these guys aren't theists. And they don't conclude that there was an external agent who created these incomprehensible conditions. What they do do is they say, well, our understanding of physics must be mistaken. Perhaps there isn't a cosmological constant after all. Well, that might be. But what this does tell us, at least physics as we know it today, seem to suggest that there was a designer of the universe that laid it out with life in mind. Arno Penzias and his colleague were the two uh, physicists who uh, discovered, or, or I should say verified, the Big Bang in 1964. They won a Nobel Prize as a result. They discovered a blanket of microwave radiation in the center of our universe, and from that point, the universe is expanding. Um, and so this seemed to confirm the Big Bang, and it, they both won Nobel Prizes as a result. Well, later on, as they started to understand uh, how physics works more in conjunction with our universe, they saw that it, in many cases, you have these constants that if they varied just a little, you couldn't have uh, intelligent life anywhere in the universe. And so Penzias turned around and he, he ended up saying this. Astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing and delicately balanced to provide exactly the conditions required to support life. In the absence of an absurdly improbable accident, the observations of modern science seem to suggest an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. Second sub-point is that data from molecular biology suggests the designer of life. Let's look at this a little bit. Francis Crick was one of the two guys who discovered DNA. Um, he uh, was an agnostic with strong leanings toward atheism. So he sees um, the molecular structure, the structure of DNA, in, and life in its most basic form. And here's what he concludes. He says, an honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have to be satisfied to get it going. Now, Crick and, and the infamous atheist astronomer Carl Sagan got together and they said, okay, well, what are the probabilities of life? It's so complex as it is. So given a four and a half billion year old Earth, what are the chances of life originating on Earth by natural causes? And so they calculated the chance to be one in, two, uh, one in 10 to the two billionth power. That's a 10 followed by two billion zeros. That's far uh, more than all the subatomic particles in the entire universe. Now you say, well, you've got Crick, who has strong leanings toward atheism. You have Sagan, who is certainly an atheist. How do they account for the origin of life on Earth? Well, they came up with a uh, theory called directed panspermia, and this just simply states there was some aliens from another planet that seeded our planet. They sent some bacteria and it landed on Earth, and that's how we got life. Well, perhaps that's the case. Um, but one thing we can look is that it looks like life came from outside the Earth, and it came from an intelligent source. Richard Dawkins is um, a militant atheist and also a, um, uh, a evolutionary biology, uh, retired evolutionary biology professor at Oxford. And he buys in. He, he holds the directed panspermia hypothesis. And a few years ago, he was in a movie called Expelled, uh, and Ben Stein ended up interviewing him. And they were talking about the first self-replicating molecule. And Stein asked him, he said, well, how did this happen? And Dawkins replied, well, we don't know. 
So you have no idea how it started. No, no. Nor has anyone else. So even today, we recognize that life on its most basic level is so complex. We don't know how it originated on Earth. We have no idea. And that's according to an evolutionary biologist who is an atheist. Antony Flew, one of the most influential atheist philosophers in the latter part of the 20th century, taught at Oxford, Cambridge, a number of places. In December of 2004, he announced that he was leaving atheism, put it behind him, and now believed that God exists. Why? Because of the scientific evidence, and he said, I had to go where the evidence leads. Michael Roos, who is a prominent philosopher of science and also an atheist, he teaches at Florida State University, he says that origins, according to the neo-Darwinian model, require a metaphysical commitment and an act of faith. The point I want to make here is when we have some who would say that Christians, theists, Christians, believe all these fairy tales about creation, but atheists have the way because they go with science, this is an illusion propagated by atheists. Atheism requires faith as well. The conclusion when we look at the data is that there is a strong case that the universe and life are products of a designer. And again, don't take my word on it. Take the word of the atheist that I've quoted on here. 